been looking at the Psalms. We've looked at Psalm 1, 2, and 3, and now we come today to Psalm number 4. Let's read it together. Psalm 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Verse number five, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. And we're reminded again as we look at this psalm that the psalms make up the Hebrew hymn book, so to speak. Uh, if you have a title in your Bible, those, title, uh, are, those titles are sometimes listed above the verses, and the title of this psalm says, for the choir director on stringed instruments, a psalm of David. So this this song, this psalm was written for the choir director. It was written for the choir director to lead in, to be sung. It was a choir song, so to speak. And it was to be played, it says, on stringed instruments. And it was written by King David himself. But this was not just a song to be sung. This is not just a song to be sung. It is a prayer to be prayed. It's a prayer to be sung. If you notice the first verse there in Psalm chapter 4, answer me when I call. So they're singing this song. David is writing this song and, and the song begins with the words, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. So this is a song that's not only meant to be sung, this is a song that is meant to be prayed. It is a prayer to God. He says, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness you have relieved me in my distress be gracious to me and hear my prayer and God has been faithful to relieve the psalmist to relieve David of his distress now David is appealing to God again in song to be gracious to him to hear him he prays or he sings a prayer for us the sons of men the people upon earth and listen to what he says in verse 2 O oh, sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? So the, the psalmist begins his prayer song, the choir begins their prayer song by calling out to God on behalf of the sons of men, on behalf of those who live in this world. And the question that's being prayed, the question that is being sung, that's being asked is, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless? The Bible says worthless, not things of lesser value, not things that aren't quite as good as, but worthless. How long are we going to love worthless things and aim at deception? Ultimately, the question for us, for the world, for the sons and the daughters of men is how long will Christ's honor be a reproach in our world? The world does not look upon Jesus Christ with honor. The world does not look upon Jesus Christ with honor. In fact, the world looks upon him with reproach. And the psalmist asks and teaches us to pray how long how long will this world choose to love what is worthless rather than what is full of worth how long will this world choose to aim at deception rather than to follow truth you think about the worthless things that we invest our few years here on earth for Pros prosperity for instance many people if not most people would say their aim in life is to make a lot of money to be prosperous people but if you think about it that is ultimately worthless that's a that's a deceptive aim when you think about the rich fool who had a wonderful crop and he wondered what he was going to do with his crop but he decided that he would tear down his barns 
he would build bigger barns, he would store up his crop, and then his story ends with him saying, then I can sit back, I can take my ease, and I can say to my soul, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You have much laid up for many years to come, but then God interjects in the story, you fool. Tonight, your soul will be required of you, and then whose will those things be? You see, we can store up all the prosperity we can ever imagine on this earth, and the moment we step into eternity, this vapor of life that we enjoy that prosperity vanishes forever, and we enter into eternity where we leave it all behind. Ultimately, our prosperity is worthless and a deceptive aim. What about possessions? I just want to get things. I want to get more stuff. I want to get the newest gadget. I want to get the newest cell. I want to get the newest car, the newest house, the newest four-wheeler, the newest boat, the newest fill-in-the-blank with whatever you want to fill in the blank with. And the reality is those things are ultimately worthless in and of themselves. Jesus said that these things are, are things that moths corrupt, things that rust corrupts, things that Thieves break in and steal, but he challenges, to, challenges us to lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven where neither moth corrupts nor rust corrupts nor thieves break in and steal. Possessions in and of themselves ultimately are a deceptive aim. What about power? If people, if people don't get their kicks from prosperity and possessions, often it's from power, and we see that uh, those who are in power, those who have roles of authority, often want to overreach that authority. They want to push the envelope. They want more power. They're never satisfied with the amount of power they have. They're never content with the amount of power that they have. And we know that this earthly power is ultimately going to be worthless as well because Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 28 that all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And we know that one day every single knee and every single tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This earthly power is a worthless deception. The pleasures of this life, they are fleeting pleasures. The popularity and the fame that we may get in this life is all worthless because in the end, if the world loves us rather than hates us, there's a problem because Jesus told us, that those who hated him would hate us. So we see this worthless deception that captivates the attention and captivates the hearts and captivates the minds of the sons of men, whether it's prosperity or possessions or pleasures or power or popularity and fame or fill in the blank with whatever it is, these these worldly deceptions capture the hearts and the minds of the sons of men and they look at Christ with reproach because Christ doesn't offer those things. Christ offers a cross. This world is deceived by the world. The world is distracted by the cares of this life. It's disillusioned by false teaching. It's disinterested in the truth because the truth costs us in this life and pays off in the life to come. How long will they look upon the truth and upon Christ with reproach? And then in verse 3, he goes on and says, but no, this is something you can know. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. So now the psalmist, as he's singing this prayer, he's looking to God and he says, you've come through for me. You've delivered me before. I know that you're going to answer me. How long are these sons of men going to reproach your name and get caught up and these temporal things that are here today and gone tomorrow, how long are they going to be caught up in worthlessness when they could have worth? But, but know, you sons of men who hear my song, that the Lord God has set me apart. He set the godly man apart for himself, and he hears when I call to him. The godly man, the one praying this prayer and singing this hymn or prayer, is first of all indebted to God. Look at what he says. And he says this very clearly and carefully. The Lord has set apart the godly man. It was the Lord who set apart the godly man. He's indebted to God. It, it was not ultimately his parents who set him apart at birth by taking him to the priests 
and having him circumcised and dedicating him in the temple. It was not ultimately his upbringing that set him apart. It was the sovereign power of God. God has done it. We sing the hymn today, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It's God that sets apart the godly man for himself. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 tells us very clearly that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're caught up in the course of this world, going along with the crowd, following the crowd in the, th in the way that we dress, in the way that we think, in the entertainment that we seek after, in the, in the things that we seek after. We're just caught up with the world. We're going along with the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, going with the flow of this world, failing to realize that the one leading the pack is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, that's who we were before God set us apart. Romans 5.10 says that if while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how, having much, how much more uh, having been reconciled will be saved by his life. So we're, we were enemies of God. It wasn't as if we set ourselves apart or our parents set us apart or our pastor set us apart or our environment or our culture set us apart. God sets the godly man apart. The Lord has set apart the godly man. He's indebted to God and he's set apart. That word set apart there could literally be translated make a distinction. So here is the godly man. He has been set apart by God. God has made a distinction between the godly man and the sons of men. He's, he's made a distinction between the godly man and those who are in the world, 2 Timothy 2.21, I love this verse. It says, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart, distinction made, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Listen, God can set us apart. He can cleanse us. He can lead us to fight and war against our sin and make us vessels of honor fit to be used, set apart, distinct. This godly man is indebted to God. He's set apart and he is heard by God. He says, the Lord hears when I call to him in the latter part of verse 3. The godly man is confident that God hears his prayer. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we ask from him. This is the confidence that we have. We have a confidence that if we ask anything that lines up with and is in accordance with his will, he's going to hear, and we know that if he hears us, he's going to answer us. There's a confidence for the godly man that the Lord hears when I call. One of my favorite promises in the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. And Jesus says, ask and it'll be given unto you. And in the literal Greek, it's ask and keep on asking and it will be given unto you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks and keeps on asking will receive. And to him who seeks and keeps on seeking, he will find. And the one who knocks and keeps on knocking, the door will be open to you. Him, what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? With that said, if you have a prayer request, you can put it in the comment section and we can ask him when we are finished with this devotion and we can lift up our prayer request to God. The godly man is indebted to God for setting him apart. God did this. The godly man has been made distinct, set apart, sanctified, consecrated by God. The godly man is heard by God when he prays in confidence, knowing that as he prays according to the will of God, God hears him and God will answer him. And the psalmist continues. 
he continues to sing and he's praying some requests and commands for the sons of men. So notice what he does. He's praying some requests and some commands. So as the choir sings, as the psalmist sings, God hears and those sons of men who are within the sound of his voice hear as well. And the first command he asks and prays is do not sin. In verse 4 it says tremble and do not sin. Now some of your translations, I'll go ahead and, and say this because you may have seen it if you have your Bible open. Some of your translations don't say tremble and do not sin. They may say be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. But literally that Hebrew word there means to tremble, to quake, to be disturbed. So what the psalmist is saying is you sons of men, you've seen the picture of the godly man. I've been set apart by God on purpose. He hears me when I call. Now you need to tremble. You need to quake. You need to be disturbed and do not sin. Do not sin. Literally, tremble and quake and be disturbed and do not sin. It would do us all some good. It would do us all some good if we would be disturbed over our sin. If we would, be, if we would tremble over our sin. If we would quake at our sin. If we would be angry at our sin. I'm not talking about the sins of your neighbor the sins of those people uh, in your community, the sins of those people in Washington, but our own personal sin. Think, think about the things that disturb us. Think about the things that anger us. Think about the things that make us quake inside. A virus being quarantined for another month or two or three or four. Um, politics. Politicians. Our government, the policies they put in place, the economy is making a lot of people quake and tremble and be disturbed. Would to God that sin disturbed us half as much as these things? What if our sin disturbed us half, just half as much as the economy disturbs us? What if our sin disturbed us half as much as our politics and politicians disturb us? What if our sin disturbed us half as much as this virus has disturbed us. If we could only see sin as God sees sin, we would tremble. We would be disturbed. That's what the psalmist is calling on us to do is to stop looking at all of this that the sons of men get wrapped up in. Stop getting disturbed by all the things that disturb the sons. Be disturbed at our sin so much so that we fight it tooth and nail and we stop it. Be angry. Do not sin. And then he goes on, be still. He says, meditate, the latter part of verse 4, meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. So get angry, tremble, quake, be disturbed, and, and do not sin. And then meditate, and be still. Think about that. I wonder, and none of us can play the prophet here and know the mind of God and what he is uh, seeking to bring about through all of the changes and trials and tests that we may be experiencing here uh, in this country at this time and in the world. But I wonder, could it be God wants us to be disturbed at our sinfulness, to see our sin as individuals, to see our sin as families, to see our sin as a church, to see our sin as a nation, and just... Stop with the busyness, be disturbed at our sin, and meditate on the reality that we need a deep repentance. We need a deep grace. We need God to help us. We need to meditate in our hearts, not only on our sin, but we need to meditate in our hearts on the grace, the great grace and mercy of Christ that he would allow something that would stop us in our tracks, that would take the idol of sports out of the equation, that would shake the idol of economy out of the equation, that would shake everything to its core to stop us to say, see your sin, be disturbed, go to war with your sin, 
and meditate in, in your heart on my goodness and my grace to bring this to your attention. Meditate in your heart on my mercy and compassion and patience to give you an opportunity to be still and not have to run here and there and everywhere like you were having to do two months ago. You can be quarantined. You can shut the doors. You can be still and think upon our need as individuals and as a nation to repent and to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. Stop with the noise and meditate and be still. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Cease striving. Cease striving and know that I am God. Some of you may need to hear that. Uh, you can't run uh, as many places as you could run before. You can't be with as many people as you could be with before. Some of you need to hear this. God may be saying to you, Cease striving. Be still. Just be still. Turn off the social media, not right now in the middle of this Facebook Live video, but turn off the social media, turn off the television, turn off the noise, and be still. Just be still. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Trust the Lord, verse 5. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Psalm 51 and verses 16 and 17 tell us that you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. When God calls for a sacrifice of righteousness, it's a broken heart, it's a contrite spirit, it's repentance, it's faith. And with that repentance, with that faith, faith comes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Trust in the Lord. Rest in Him. Trust in the Lord through this. Rest in Him. He's in control. And then be satisfied in Him. So the psalmist, he's singing this song. He's singing this prayer. How long are the sons of men going to reproach Christ and hang on to worthless things? Pursue worthless things and aimless deception. How long is this going to go on, Lord? We know the godly man. He's been set apart for you, by you. You hear him when he prays. I'm calling out to you, Lord. And in the earshot of these sons of men, may they be still and know that you're Lord, the Lord. May they be angry and not sin. May they trust you and be satisfied in you, verse 6. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. So he says many are saying, Would it, who will show us some good? You know, we began by looking at the reproach that the sons of men have for Christ and their, their consumption of worthlessness their obsessiveness over worthlessness and aimless deception. And now we hear them saying, who will show us some good? Who will give us something? And that's what the world is constantly asking. What can you do for me, God? That's why preachers who preach sermon after sermon after sermon on what God can do for you, how God can help you, how God can make your dreams come true, how God can meet all of your needs, how God can be your bellhop. You ring the bell and he runs to you to see what he can do for you. Preachers who preach sermons like that fill the stadiums. That's what people want to hear. They want to know, what can you do for me, God? What are you going to do for me, God? How can you help me, God? Are you going to make my dreams come true God. And then the psalmist chimes in and says, yes, Lord, lift up your countenance among us. And they could be echoing the blessing of Numbers 6, 23 to 27, where Moses was told to tell Aaron and his sons to bless the sons of Israel and say this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord, li listen, the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I will bless them. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious. Lift up his countenance on you. And that's what the psalmist is saying. Everybody wants God to do something for them. Lift up your countenance upon us, O Lord. But notice what the godly man says. You have put gladness in my heart. 
more than when their grain and new wine abound. This is important not to miss. The psalm began with the sons of men reproaching Christ, reproaching the ways of God, caught up in the worthless pursuit of this world, aimless deception, prosperity, possessions, popularity, pleasures, power, fame, whatever it is, chasing after the ultimately worthless, aimless deceptions of this life. And now the psalmist says at the end, but you, God, you have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. When their checking accounts are, are bursting at the seams, when they have everything they think they want, you, God, have put more pleasures in my heart and more gladness in my heart than they will ever know apart from you. The psalmist finds his joy in God. The gladness in his heart exceeds all that this world has to offer. In Psalm 1611, it says, In your presence is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. You want joy? No, you want fullness of joy. You don't want joy. You want fullness of joy. Where do you find fullness of joy in the presence of God, you don't find fullness of joy in prosperity or you wouldn't keep wanting more. You don't find fullness of joy in possessions or you wouldn't keep wanting bigger and better and more. You don't find fullness of joy in power and popularity and prestige or you wouldn't keep pursuing more. You, wouldn't, you don't find fullness of joy in pleasures of this life or you would, you would be satisfied. Instead, you keep chasing after aimless deceptions, fullness of joy. Not just joy, but fullness of joy is found in Christ. In His right hand are pleasures forever. It reminds me of the parable Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Here this man walks through a field that is likely barren, it's likely useless. He stumbles upon a treasure. He hides the treasure. He goes and sells everything that he has in order to buy this worthless field. All of the sons of men are reproaching him. They're laughing at him. They're wondering why he's departing with his worthless, aimless deception of prosperity and possessions and the things that he accumulated for a worthless field. But he knows something that they don't know, that in that field there's a treasure. And with that treasure, there's fullness of joy. With that treasure, there's pleasures forevermore. Jesus goes on and says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. We are all looking for pleasure. We're all looking for joy. We're all looking for that pearl. We're all looking for that treasure. And I'm going to tell you, the only place that we'll find it in its fullness is in Christ. And that's what the psalmist says. Do we want to join the sons of man reproaching Christ by getting wrapped up and consumed and distracted by worthless worldly pursuits and aimless deception? Or do we want to find our fullness of joy in him? He says in verse 8, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. I've noticed something over the past several years, uh, and maybe it's been around forever, but it seems to really have been a, be a problem lately, is the number of people who complain that they have trouble sleeping. They can't fall asleep. They can't stay asleep. They struggle to sleep. And here is the psalmist who says, In peace, I will both lie down and I will sleep. Why? Because for you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Do you see what he does here? He says, you alone. It's you alone. It's not my soldiers that surround me, King David, as he's writing this song. I'm sure he's surrounded by his mighty men. It's not my armies of Israel. It's not my chariots. It's not my horses. It's not my palace. It's not my power. It is you alone, O Lord, that allows me to lie down and sleep in peace. If I'm on the run from Absalom like we saw last week, I can lie down and rise up because of you. If I'm on the run from Saul, I can lie down and I can rise up 
because of you. When the sons of men are reproaching the name of Christ and reproach my name, I can lie down and sleep in peace. Listen, if we're having trouble sleeping, if we're having trouble resting, then we may need to ask ourselves, do we really believe and trust that it is God alone that makes us to dwell in safety? Or are we too wrapped up in thinking that that, that safety and that peace and that security is out here somewhere, whether it's in our government or whether it's in our national government or whether it's in our armies or whether it's in our bank accounts or whether it's in our retirement funds or whether it's in the stock market. We can't lie down and sleep if we think our security and our peace and our rest is there. But no, we will rest when we, like the psalmist, say, All I need to know that I'm secure is my God. You alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Would to God that we would have that peace. Do you know Him today? Have you turned from your sin, from your reproach of Christ, from your pursuit of worthless, aimless, deceptive, worldly things to find your pleasure and your fullness of joy and your hope and your peace and your security in Christ. If not, I want to encourage you. I want to plead with you. We want to beg you today to turn away from your sin. Turn away from, your, from this world. Turn away from this reproaching of Christ and turn to God through faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross when he took our sin upon himself on the cross and died on the cross and was buried in a tomb and rose on Sunday morning. Find your peace in him. Now think about this psalm. Can you hear Jesus praying this psalm? Can you hear Jesus praying for us right now. I think if Jesus is praying for us right now, he could be praying this psalm. And the Bible says that he is interceding for us. Hebrews 7, 25 says he always lives, he always lives to make intercession for us. He's at the right hand of God the Father and he intercedes for us without ceasing. Can you hear him pray, oh, sons of men, as he looks down upon this world, Oh, sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? But know the Lord. The Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Trust in me. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up your countenance upon us, O Lord. But I can put gladness in your heart. More than your grain and new, your new wine can when they abound. Can you hear him praying that for you right now? Could you hear him praying something like that for you right now? Listen, we are at a prime place in our nation's history, in our own personal history to have a perfect time to do a personal do-over, to hit the restart button, and to say, you know what? I'm going to take my eyes off of all of this worthless, aimless, deceptive, worldly things, and I'm going to stop reproaching Christ by focusing more of my energy and effort and love and passion towards those things, and I'm going to be set apart. I'm going to call upon my Lord, and I'm going to know Him and find my joy in him. Now's the perfect time to do that. And we sure hope and we sure pray that you would. Now.